Hello and welcome to CNR Extra on City TV. My name is Nanatu Fuobwati. Coming up. Commissioner of Customs of the Ghana Revenue Authority accuses Special Prosecutor of peddling falsehood about him following a report which accused the Council of State member of corruption-related offences in connivance with the Commissioner. Anybody who has read that report very well will know the basis of that. And luckily for me, God is always on my side. Also coming up, chiefs in the Krobo area appeal to President Kufuado to set up an independent committee to investigate the current outage in the area. Purposely, I know we paid and the implement in the country because of uh, the estate houses. Still ahead, Senior Staff Association of the University for Development Studies, Tamale, declare strike. This morning, and to collect my certificates and other, but they are saying they are on strike, they will not attend to me. I have to go back and come back here and look at the fair from that place to here. And later, Ghana's inflation continues its rising streak, hitting 31% in July. Anyone from 7%? Indicating, indicating an increase from 29.8%, which was recorded for the month of May 20, for the month of June 2022. Many thanks for choosing us. Before we go into the stories, I'd like to sure. say good morning to you, Jude uh, Mensa Duncan of the City News Show. Good morning, Anna. Welcome, welcome, Thank welcome. You it's so always great to so have much. you. You can also join in the conversation uh, via the WhatsApp number 0550-585832. Let us know what you think about the stories that we will be bringing you. In our first story, um, the special prosecutor uh, put out a report indicting a Council of State member. Uh, in a corruption and corruption related uh, offenses. Now, the Commissioner of Customs uh, has taken a swipe at the OSP. Take a look at this clip. Customs under the Ghana Revenue Authority, Colonel Retired Kojo Damwa, is, has accused the special prosecutor, Kisia Jibeng, of maliciously peddling falsehood about him to tarnish his image. The special prosecutor, in his latest report, accused Council of State member Eunice Jacqueline Bua Samwa Hine of corruption-related offences were in, which were in connivance with the Commissioner of Customs and his deputy, the company La Bianca, allegedly has evaded import duties since 2017. Now, although the Office of the Special Prosecutor has recovered the over 1 million Ghana cities from the company, which represents a shortfall of revenue, the Commissioner of Customs insists a due process were followed, as it is standard procedure. We have more on this report. In November 2021, one Frank Asare petitioned the Office of the Special Prosecutor to launch investigations into the Customs Division of the Ghana Revenue Authority and also La Bianca Company and its subsidiaries for alleged evasion of import duties since 2017. Following the release of the report by the Special Prosecutor that a Council of State member who doubles as a member of the Board of Directors of the Ghana Ports and Harbors Authority, has engaged in underhand dealings with the Customs Division of the GRA. Many have called for her resignation from the Council of State. But speaking on the opening of a three-day retreat for members of the Ghana Revenue Authority in Kumase, the Commissioner of Customs, Kenel Retard Kujo Damois, described the report by the Special Prosecutor as hollow and lacks merit. He alleged that the Special Prosecutor is only pursuing the matter just to bring his name into disrepute after he refused to second a GRA officer to the office of the Special Prosecutor. He also says Mr. Kisi Jabing has connived with a former staff of GRA to tarnish his image. The report purporting or coming from the office of a special prosecutor trying to indict the deputy commissioner of prisons and myself. And if anybody who has read that report very well will know the basis of that. 
And luckily for me, God is always on my side. Before that report came, that person had made a statement to some people who had come to them. He was going to publish something that will discredit me, and he would do that. And I even sent people to go and tell him that he's a small boy. I'm older than him. I have lived a meaningful life. If he attempts to destroy me, it won't be easy for him. People have tried it. I have survived. And this one too, I'll survive. All that happened. One of the reasons was because of Mr. Akurugu. He wanted Mr. Akurugu to be seconded to his office. And I said no. Mr. Akurugu is a custom officer, primarily employed to do customs work. And he is to partner Mr. Akutofachin in that office, African Continental Free Trade Area. He deals with tariffs and valuation. And therefore, I cannot second him to the office of the special prosecutor. Colonel Retard Kojo Damwa maintains that the customs officials followed due process in offering a 5 to 10 percent reduction of the values for frozen products that La Bianca had imported into the country. But if you read it very well, there's nothing in it. It's hollow. Um, it's actuated by malice. And the, those who are behind it, they know themselves. They know themselves. They've tried it several times. It is not working. And they want it won't work. I'm ready for any prosecution. That's what he must do. Not to say that they should do further investigations up to 2017. Up to 2015. I have letters written by Deputy Commissioner Demis Agavo granting similar things. And I produced them when he called me. Speaking on the CDD, Shraj and Ghana Statistical Service recently released Afrobarometer and the Ghana Integrity of Public Services survey that indicated that custom officials are among the most corrupt in the country. The Commission of Customs vehemently opposed it. He says the survey is baseless and cannot be a reflection of the reality. The Afrobarometer report. Then they cite GRA, Custom DTRD. And you look at the sample size, the basis of the conclusion. And I have had personal experiences. And I'm always saddened by the fact that people easily jump to conclusions and say customs are corrupt. I mean, if you judge from this report, mm -hmm. clearly gives you an indication that there's some friction between Colonel Retired Kodjo Damwa and the special prosecutor mm. or his office. He makes some really interesting yeah. allegations mm. and some of which we can substantiate with regards to mm. one Mr. Krugu wanting to be to seconded be, yeah. to the office of the, mm. the special prosecutor. But listening to the commissioner yesterday speak, um, Nanatu, for one thing, was really clear mm. and I felt it was very important for him to rather than attack the messenger, mm. you attack the, the message. message itself. So, mm. I mean, the spe office of the special prosecutor. Yeah, but if you kill the messenger, then there's no message at all. Yeah, but if you look <laughs> at the merits of the, the, mm. the accusations leveled against mm. you and sought to explain the issues, mm. if indeed you feel that you've been unfairly mm. treated or unfairly accused, but to sort of attack the, the messenger mm. to a large extent makes it look like you don't have a case at all. Yeah. I mean, yesterday on Eyewitness News, we listened to the Chamber of mm. Trade and, and Freight, and yes. um, I think the executive director was mm. speaking to Sander, and he was speaking to the issues. He was addressing um, the, the, the mm. reports the Office of the Special Prosecutor put out. To an extent, he even mentioned that if you look at the Custom mm. Act of 2015-891, where it sort of mm. give a lot of discretionary powers to the Commissioner and the Commissioner General, some of these things, if you have to be um, re-looked at again, should be done in, in that regard. So, for me, that was mm. what I was expecting the Commissioner General mm. to come out with, but to sort of attack... Uh, the messenger mm. to say that he's a small boy, he's seeking to destroy you, mm. and 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 uh, he would fail if he. I exactly, mean, all of yeah. those things are mm. uh, the lighter side of it. Exactly. And really I, I feel that he could have really gone uh, on the trajectory of the law, pick the customs act, exactly. and go by it and say that well, per mm. so so and so dictates of the law, I did nothing wrong. Because mind you, Duke, the payment of the one over one million cities, yeah. more or less, is an admission of guilt. That is exactly what it's in the mind of mm. a lot of Ghanaians and if you look at the office of the special prosecutor's report to a very large extent is the deputy commissioner uh, that is Mr. Edu 
um, Joseph Educhi, mm. who was largely reported to have been the one to have given yeah. this leeway with regards to some of the deals that was given to uh, the Labianca company. And but of course, the commissioner mm. is cited because, yeah. of course, ultimate responsibility lies, lies with, him. with him. So it's it, it looks like a planned thing. That mm. is, if it's indeed uh, proven that mm. uh, there were some corruption activities happening there. But then again, I saw it. I see it as very refreshing coming mm. from the office of the special prosecutor, especially when they say that um, they need there's a need for mm. a structure integrity plan yeah. because more often than not, when there's the way for a lot of discretion mm. to be used in deciding some of these things, especially with regards to the custom advance ruling, mm -hmm. like we know at the ports, then some of these things are more likely to come up. And like, like, I don't expect it to only be with the customs, right. public agencies as a whole. Mm. There's the need for that proper mm. structure integrity plan to really keep some of these things. But mm. I mean, the facts are bare and a lot more responsibility lies on the customs mm. to be able to prove themselves that indeed there are no wrong because i mean it's not something new if yeah. you look at the recent afrobarometer reports exactly. they, they were cited mm. as being one of the most corrupt mm. agencies, agencies in the country so mm. if now we are hearing of reports like this mm. and your defense of the reporters is to attack them and message. say that somebody mm. wanted to be seconded to the office and mm. couldn't be seconded mm. and for that reason um you feel like mm. you are being witch hunted i, I find it very unfortunate right, i expect right. you to mm. really address the issues mm. as as they come perhaps he enjoys the heat because he seems to have taken <laughs> it from uh, the member of the council of states who really was the one catching the heat yeah, uh, but uh, uh, I, from his statement yesterday he seems to have drawn all the attention to himself now. And, and that is the most <laughs> unfortunate part because mm. it's not about the attention mm. seek. it shouldn't exactly. be about attention exactly. it should be about setting house the record cleaning. house e cleaning exactly yeah. it should be about mm. setting the record straight so all for right. me a lot more mm. needs to be done if he indeed wants to convince Ghanaians and clear his name uh, exactly right let's move on to another story that uh, seems to not want to go away the umpires between the ECG and the people of the Krobo area chiefs and indigents of the Krobo area have appealed to President Ekufuadu to set an independent committee to investigate the current outage in the area. They made the appeal when a delegation from the Jubilee House engaged some divisional chiefs and indigents of Manya Krobo in the eastern region over the blackouts. Emergency Deba, which was convened under the leadership of Nene Tete Zugli III, the Pengua Divisional Chief saw hundreds of residents attending at the forecourt of the Dom Divisional Chief's Palace at Manya Pauno. The purpose of the engagement is to help maintain peace in the area and find lasting solutions to the current ampas so ECG can restore power back to the area. Nene Olepeme Nano Sakino, the Chief of Okonya addressing the gathering indicated that no agreement has been reached with the management of the electricity company of Ghana and further called on President Nanadu to set an independent committee to investigate the current outage. Nene Olipeme advised against the installation of prepaid meters in the area. I know, purposely, I know prepaid have been implemented in the country because of uh, the estate houses that uh, people face their houses and after facing their houses, in the morning they went to work, they closed their, their gates, even at times there, is, there are some these big doors in the house, so ECG workers cannot enter the house and read meters. That is what, that is the idea of implementing prepaid card. Now, if it, is, uh, it becomes a government policy for Ghanaians to use it, there should be education that will help Head of Asset Recovery at the Office of the President, Robert Tetefio Ajasin, who led the delegation from the Jubilee House, assured the residents of channeling all their grievances to the President and confirmed that engineers are currently inspecting damaged transmission lines for power to be restored. The bullet points that we are sending it back to the Presidency for them to address this is, uh, uh, you know, more times or more other times, the information is reaching us. Some of them, if you don't even go to the ground, they send to the grounds and go and hear from the process over. We think whatever they are saying is true. We understand. You think whatever they are saying is the truth. We've come, let's and we know what is happening. Meanwhile, the Yulu Krobo Municipal Security Council 
is calling on the national security to have the game and get all persons who attacked personnel of ECG and destroyed gadgets of the electricity company of Ghana to face the loss of the land. The municipal chief executive of Hilo Krobo, Eric Tete, has been lamenting the impact of the current power outage on all operations of the assembly. What, what uh, makes our, our situation difficult is that we are unable now to go to uh, shop owners and people who uh, uh, trade in the municipality to take our money that they are supposed to give us. You know, they are, uh, these shop owners are, able, are supposed to pay some form of uh, taxes to us and if they are struggling to run and this morning i went to a pharmacy shop and uh, he told me he buys 150 ganas of, but of fuel on a daily basis and certainly if such a person is owing you you cannot ask him to pay you first eric tete who revealed that another stakeholder engagement will be held in accra tomorrow further indicated that Ilo Krobo has been a victim of the current impasse and called on the national security to arrest and ensure the prosecution of persons who attacked personnel of the electricity company of Ghana. You, I don't know, I'm struggling to understand the difficulty with addressing this issue. Mm. The people there need the power. Mm -hmm. ECG, you need your money. Mm. Why are we not at the table, I mean, finding a lasting solution to this matter you see the people of Krobo have been complaining that it is not as if they do not want the prepaid meters but then over the years they have been overbilled by the ecg mm. and that's why they've refused to pay and so the fear is that if they do accept the prepaid meters the previous bills will be passed on through the prepaid metering system and, and I think the ECG has been quite clear mm. on some of these concerns they've raised. But I agree with you, Tufo. It's a very complex one, mm. a very, very complex situation with so many undertones and, and of course, historical antecedents mm. uh, come into this as well. But see, I, 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 in, in, in a really short time, I've never seen any issue mm. as complex as this where all the stakeholders, all the major stakeholders in this have acted mm. so wrongly and with so much bad faith as this yeah. particular issue, issue with regards to blackouts in, in Kroboland. Mm. I mean, the Krobo residents being the, the exactly. key stakeholder, um, political leadership, mm -hmm. and of course the ECG. the ECG. I feel all these three mm. stakeholders mm. have acted in bad faith. Mm. Take the Krobo residents, for instance. Mm. I mean, for some of them, and I agree, not all of them in the area Mm. are towing that line with regards to us um, hurting ECG mm. officials, resisting the prepaid meters. And I mean, if, if you speak to um, um, people over there, and even our correspondent on the ground yesterday mm. mentioned for a fact that a lot more of the residents, especially in areas like Somenia and, and its neighboring towns, actually have accepted the prepaid meters. Mm. So it's just a few bad nuts who are, who are exactly. pushing for some of these mm. things. And, and for me, I find it very mm. regrettable and very unpatriotic on their part to sort of foment mm. trouble on an issue that should be quite simple and straightforward. Yeah, but you see, this can be easily addressed. The community knows these people. Give them up, mm. let the ECG people feel safe, mm. and then they can restore power, go through the metering system, and case closed. That's it, because really, that mm. is the concern of the ECG officials. Exactly. That they say they will restore power. Yesterday on the point of view, since yeah. you have said it, that they will restore power if when they feel, they feel safe. safe. Yeah, and that's why I expect, for instance, an, uh, an agency like the National Security to mm. step in. I mean, fishing out these troublemakers shouldn't be much of a big deal for them. I, I know if they put in the work, they should be able to identify it. But you see, there's that sort of political risk attached mm. to it in trying to deal with some of these situations. Mm. I mean, mm. it has political implications, exactly. if you are being very mm. honest with ourselves. So political leadership is mm. seeing it in a certain way. I mean, it, mm. was, it, was, it was quite good. And somewhat refreshing hearing yesterday that a delegation from the Jubilee House, House yeah. was was mm. at the place during the mm. Adeba to find a lasting mm. solution to it. But respectfully, uh, looking at the delegation that way, mm. I thought it was a little lightweight, mm. if you ask me. Yeah. I mean, government, if it wanted to take this seriously in the past, mm. should have taken a decisive exactly. action. And the notion is such that it will cost you an electoral fortune if you take some really unpopular decision. decisions. But you see, yeah. at the long run, it's a decision that will be in the country's interest. Because last Clearly. time we heard the Minister of Energy, the Energy Minister mm. speaking about 800 million Ghana cities 
that's about three point two billion dollars. It's it's lost to exactly um, um, mm. forty bills and all of illegal those connections issues, illegal and connections all and all right. of those issues. So I feel government mm. needs to start looking at the long term. Mm. Maybe in the short term it will cost you political fortunes, mm. but, but then in the long term yeah. it will go ahead to, to, to help to the nation uh, itself. Yes, mm. and, and very briefly on the ECG, mm. the approach of just taking off the whole area mm. when indeed they admit that they could have found some selective yeah people areas who were, who individuals. were yeah. individuals who were trying to resist this mm. for me doesn't hold at all because i mean for instance why would you want to take off the mm. whole community when hospitals are affected schools mm. are affected students are writing exams they mm. can't study in the evening i mean back in school prep was a really big thing for students mm. you go to the classrooms well, at night now to that study. the chiefs have appealed to the president hopefully we'll we see need some, a lot more decisive we'll, we'll see action. some light at the end of the and tunnel it takes a lot mm. more decisive and tough decision exactly. making to let me take you this. up north uh, to uds tamale uh, there's an ongoing strike there. Now, past and present students of the University for Development Studies, UDS Tamale Campus, who visited the institution to access some administrative services, were left stranded. This follows a strike declared by Senior Staff Association of the University. Today, Citizens' visit to the university saw some students stranded in an attempt to access administrative services. Our Northern Regional Correspondent, Dainan Wang, has more. Right from the main entrance of the university, one could feel the impact of the strike. Security men who, on a normal day, would have been in their uniforms, were casually dressed and sitting unconcerned as people moved in and out of the campus. This is as a result of an indefinite strike declared by Tertiary Education Workers Union, Ghana Association of University Administrators, and the Senior Staff Association. The unions are, among other things, agitating over delays in the payment of July salaries and the decision by the university to migrate staff to the controller and accountant general's mechanized payroll system without broad consultation of relevant unions. City News' visit to the central administration of the university saw most offices closed. Some students who came to assess their certificates and transcripts were seen seated at the academic affairs department without anyone attending to them. Some of them spoke to City News. I came this morning and to collect my certificates and other, but they are saying they are on strike, they will not attend to me. I have to go back and come back here and look at the fair from that place to here. I think those who are responsible for their welfare will do that so that they will attend to us. It is a cost to us. So we are leaving to the authority to look and solve their problem for them. I studied nursing here, but then I'm coming for my transcript. But due to they being on strike, um, I've not been attended to, so I'm going back. Yeah, I need it. It's urgent. Yeah, so I don't know. <laughs> it's really going to affect me. I'm Tamale here, and I came to take my certificate. So I came around 10 o'clock, and now it's time. I've been trying to get the officers attend to me, but um, it seems they are on strike. So I'm finding it difficult to, de to get them. Meanwhile, city news sources within management indicate that even though the government has not released its subvention since January this year, they still managed to pay salaries. According to the source, July salaries have been processed and will soon reflect in the accounts of the staff. So both current and past students who have been here to assess various forms of services have been left stranded. They are calling on authorities to address the concerns of these staff for them to come back to work. From the UDS campus, Tamale, I am Daina Ngon for City News. It's just a matter of bad blood between the management of the institution and the various unions that work uh, in the institution. Because, I mean, if you look at the grievances on which they are striking, really, it does not transcend the university. Yeah. It's, it's, an, it's internal, an internal yeah. issue. I mean, 
non-payment of salary. That's July salaries. Mm -hmm. Delay in payment of July salary without prior notice. Uh, migration onto the mechanized payroll of the controller and accountant general. I mean, and then of course they complain of some poor managerial and uh, skills of the leadership of the school. I mean, I think an internal problem that could be addressed almost immediately to yeah. take the strike thing away. I mean, sometimes and more often than not, a lot of these groups, all they really want is uh, an administration or a management mm. that is indeed listening to them. Okay. So uh, to go all out and, and, and declare an indefinite strike, then it means that there was some sort of um, high-level breakdown of, mm. of communication, communication from management yeah. to, to the, the staffers. Mm. So we'd want to plead on this platform because um, it's very difficult for mm. students when some of these things happen. It affects them in a lot more ways mm -hmm. than um, they think it's, 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 it's And in impact. this case, past students are also bearing the brunt. Exactly. It's fortunate, but mm. management should make efforts to reach out to these leaders of these striking groups mm. and listen to what their concerns are. I'm sure they can sort of meet halfway to address all the challenges sure. they are facing. All right. Um, stay with us on CNR Extra, still ahead. GPRT, you expresses confidence in reintroduction of vehicle tow and policy. We'll be right back with the details. Don't go away. Welcome back. You're watching CNR Extra on City TV. I'm in the studio with Jude Mensah Duncan, and we'd like for you to join us via WhatsApp. The number is 0550-585832. Now, there was an accident in which one person is feared dead. Let's get the details in this report. Now, one person is feared dead, while seven others, including children, are receiving treatment at the Winneba Trauma and Specialist Hospital after a vehicle belonging to the Jumako campus of the University of Education, Winneba, crashed into them. Eyewitnesses say the vehicle lost control, crashing into the group who were returning from church in a tricycle. City News' regional correspondent for the Central Region, Calvus Tete, has more. According to eyewitnesses, the victims in the tricycle were returning from church late yesterday, but upon reaching Ijumaku Tejiman, they were run into by the Toyota Haze. In all, one person died while seven others who sustained various degrees of injuries have been transferred to the Trauma and Specialist Hospital in Winneba and the Cape Coast Teaching Hospital for further treatment. The Ijumaku District Police Command was quickly called in to rescue the injured. Here are some eyewitnesses speaking to City News about the incident. Residents are worried about the excessive speed by both tricycle and commercial drivers and wants the police to intensify operations on the Jumakutechiman stretch. 
it's always unfortunate that uh, lives are lost uh, in such a manner. I mean, it calls for more attention to the safety of our roads yeah. and, of course, respect for road traffic regulations. Yeah, I mean, and isn't it interesting that Africa is the least motorized region in the world, just about 2% of the world's uh, population of vehicles, but it's the highest in terms of death on our roads. No Clearly, roads. something is not being done right. Mm. Uh, if you look at the figures from the National Road Safety Authority, 1,300 people died from January to June 2022. I mean, it's a significant decline from the same thing the year before, yeah. but clearly uh, we need to still do better. It's of an course. improvement, I mean, losing but... Losing 1,300 lives on it's, our it's no mean joke. Yeah. I mean, it was more, way more the previous mm. year. It's come down. Still mm. doesn't mean that we should mm. let our guards down. I mean, down. whatever is being done to record this reduction yes. should be intensified. Exactly. So we reduce the number exactly. to the barest minimum. But, but that being said, I mean, some road users mm. still need to be very cautious on the road. I mean, the... the Careless mm. abandon on the road is, is nothing mm. to write home about these days. Mm. So we want to admonish a lot of these road users to be very careful when using the roads. Clearly. Well, the GPRTU is making some moves to ensure safety on our roads. They are introducing a vehicle towing system. Now, the Ghana Private Road Transport Union, GPRT, the majority of drivers will welcome the reintroduction of the towing system. The Transport Union on Tuesday, August 9, launched a new towing system which has been rolled out in partnership with the Road Safety Management Services Limited. The system will allow drivers to subscribe to an online application that has been developed to effectively deliver the service of towing. Speaking to City News, the Deputy General Secretary for the GPRT, Richard Amankwa, says motorists should subscribe to the system because its merits outweigh the demerits. It is common to see broken down vehicles left unattended to on major roads across the country. Most of these disabled cars, mostly trucks carrying load for a long trip, are left on busy roads for days. To make matters worse, some of these trucks are left on the roads with no caution indication, thereby posing a risk to other road users. Data from the Motor Traffic and Transport Department of the Ghana Police Service reveals that many accidents recorded are as a result of human negligence, which includes disabled cars left on the road. In 2021, a student and some traders on board a commercial vehicle towards Accra lost their lives after their car ran into a stationary vehicle at Tesano, a suburb of Accra. The new steam store of the NC stretch, which connects Accra to Kumasi, showed many broken down vehicles left in no one's care. I'm currently on the N6, which is one of the highways here in the country. And this is precisely the um, Achimota Mal 7 stretch. And just behind me are some vehicles that have lined up, which we understand are all broken down. Now, unfortunately, for over two to three hours, they are still stationed here and their drivers are working on them to get them off the road. Now, you would know that this particular situation poses a threat to oncoming vehicles, particularly at night, where uh, most drivers have complained that it makes visibility difficult and so they have been calling for something to be done about it. Sometimes when we are, our car goes forward on the road, sometimes before we get to a car, we find it difficult to get. Or sometimes to when we go for it, it's very expensive for us. So I, I wish, like the one that uh, GPR TV people are bringing out, I like it, so like I will support them that they should bring it so that it will help the whole nation. If you say that it's expensive, around how much are, are we looking at? Mostly how much do they cook? Normally, sometimes it depends on the distance. Uh -huh. With the, uh, yeah, the distance, uh, normally, sometimes normally they used to take like 1,000, 2,000, 3,000 and those things. 
Uh -huh. Because of it, it has become like emergency. Uh -huh. So that's how they used to do it. And, and, and we also know that when vehicles like this are left on the road, at times it causes um, accidents and all that. Have you encountered a situation where maybe you nearly run into a broken down vehicle? Oh, yeah, yeah. From Kumasi, I was on my way to Kumasi to Accra. Then I kept a car spot that I, I didn't know that I had a car spot over there. So immediately I read the car before I get to know it. Unfortunately, I get to see it very, very fast before I read there. Not so like I would have hit the back, like I would have caused accident. One of the cars be on your problem or in some or I'm a car car is S A and you just see oh, you know I say na how much you say you call how much no we be in C H I no buy no be hit C A. You put the instant and no move here. So in car to me the car. BB say everybody okay, 100 percent okay. Sometimes you know, when you call the um, when you call the touring cars, you know, the amount is very high. Is like uh, how much you do this? Uh, the way my master said, uh, like 600, 300, 400, it depends the distance in which he will be, the person will be taking the vehicle to. So I think the way the 50 Ghana is okay. It is against this backdrop that GPRTU wants to ensure a mandatory towing system where drivers will be charged a token for its services. The GPRTU says it's confident drivers will adhere to the new directive to save lives on the road. It's a system which has been cut off during uh, its first implementation and we are now coming to do it. So it needs, as you said, a broader consultation and education. The drivers, we must to tell them the importance of it and how it will help them. Moreover, the rate, as I said earlier, has been reduced or has been subsidized. So that, even, that will, com will, will even compare them to do it. Because from 50 cities up to 200, assuming you are using a taxi or a truck van and you are paying a taxi, you are paying 50 cities a year. You just divide 50 cities by 365. Look at the, num uh, the, the, the money he's supposed to pay daily. It's just a, a, a peanut, just a mi very minute. The GPRTU is set to roll out the policy coming October 2022. For most motorists, the initiative by the GPRTU to reintroduce the towing system is a step in the right direction and it's a welcoming one. Yeah, that's hopeful that this will help curb the spate of road carnage on the streets. Reporting for City News, I am Kweku Ediyama Ansa. A good move, a good policy. I'm just hoping that um, the explanation or the communication and education goes down, down because the, uh, it is the drivers themselves who will be the major stakeholders mm. in this, that they will get the understanding and subscribe to this policy. I mean, we recall in 2018, that about when government sort of instituted or sought to bring about the, the mandatory, the mandatory the road, um, towing yeah. levy. Mm. And we remember the public furore that greeted exactly. some of these things. But yeah. with hindsight, it looks as mm. though it wasn't an entirely wrong decision, exactly. not necessarily a money-making move, but mm. rather a life-saving initiative would mm. have been at the time. Because no, no, it's, it's serious, the, the, the blatant disregard for road regulations when you mm. use some of these highways, especially with regards to breaking down vehicles. Yeah. A vehicle will break down, will not even have the, the safety triangular um, 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 Signed. I mean, it's it's so many of the things yeah. that happen yeah. on our roads are quite mm. unfortunate. So mm. it's 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 a step in the right direction. Mm. One of the reasons why we see some of these um, challenges on the road is because, mm. like we heard in the reports, the high cost of these towing services. Exactly. So if yeah. there's a centralized system mm. where after every month, depending mm. on the payment mode, maybe you contribute something small mm. so that when your vehicle breaks down, you're able to be attended to swiftly, mm. I think it's a step in the right mm. direction. Not necessarily for just the drivers, mm. but Ghanaians are slack because, yeah. I mean, some of these road mm. accidents are, are caused by mm. some of these infractions we see here and there. Well, this is for GPR2 drivers, but we do know that the National Road Safety Authority mm. uh, is in the process of making some amendments to the road mm. uh, traffic regulations, LI, mm. where they will introduce uh, the a, 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 a mandatory road towing uh, policy. Mm. And so hopefully 
uh, that should come out and then we'll see how it goes and involves all other road users mm -hmm. all other drivers across uh, the country well the food and drugs authority is in the news again and this time uh, they are training their staff um, of course on handling uh, or, or propagating or educating Ghanaians on vaccines well, the Foods and Drugs Authority, the FDA, has indicated of plans to begin training its staff and setting up over state of the art laboratory as part of efforts towards the manufacturing of vaccines in the country. In line with this, 2.8 million euros has been allocated to the authority. There's more in this report. President Akufado, in his State of the Nation address in March this year, said Ghana will start producing its own COVID-19 vaccines in January 2024. Speaking to the media on the sidelines of the launch of the institutional and technical strengthening of the Food and Drugs Authority for Vaccine Manufacturing in Ghana, CEO of the authority, Delisi Dako, stated that her outfit is working to bring its staff up to speed with the latest vaccine production skills and technology. In the times of COVID, yes, we we're testing vaccines. The vaccines that came in, we did test them, but we did not need to do them. So now we are building the capacity to be able to, we are building a molecular laboratory that we did not have. Okay, we do not currently have it. We are building a clean room. Okay, so that is what they are, they are, they are, um, the GIZ and the EU are funding. Um, to inspect a vaccine plant, yes, we've been inspecting the vaccine plants all over the world. So we have that capacity. But we need to train more people to be able to do it. So we have inspectors, we need to train more people. Um, evaluating vaccine um, documentation, we have people who can do it. We are going to train more people because the, the factories are going to be here. Okay, so really at the moment what the capacity is, is that we will build our, our laboratory to um, a level which is called the biosafety level uh, four, uh, biosafety level three, so we can test the vaccines ourselves here, all the specifications. You know, there are new um, vaccines that are coming. You know, we have the mRNA technology that is coming. New technologies are coming. We are building capacity within our laboratories to be able to do that. And that is what they are helping us with. Speaking at the same event, German Development Corporation expressed its commitment to ensuring Ghana begins the production of vaccines. Our initiative is actually part of a general support to the vaccine committee. I'm sure you heard about the vaccine committee today, which is moving to a vaccine institute. And our role as a German Development Corporation is to support uh, this process so that in future, Ghana is ready to produce their own vaccines, first through a fill and finish approach and later to uh, um, a full uh, production, production process. Meanwhile, government says it will be collaborating with the private sector to ensure the project materializes. What you want to do is to build capacity in Ghana for Ghana to become a hub like it's been done in India and everywhere. So Ghana government is going to, is going to work through the private sector. So the private sector will be assisted, facilitated and we coordinate the activities of the private sector to be able to put up factories in the country to provide a well-recognized food and drugs, well-recognized vaccines and other biologicals. The, the Ministry of Health have come out of a uh, national vaccine policy. We have also come out with the roadmap and is uh, going through the, pro we have gone through the stakeholders processes with the academia, everybody who concerns, and now we have a roadmap that we are working off. The drive by this government uh, to produce vaccines locally is one worth commending because mm. you see, even from when we were young, the myths and of course um, or, or the hesitancy that comes with any introduction or announcement of a vaccine was really high. And so, and it all had to do with the vaccines being produced by foreigners sure. and coming with a particular agenda and yeah. all that. So I think if we're producing locally, it will go a long way to boost the confidence of people to accept mm. these vaccines mm. and to take them. I, I wish I could just uh, agree with you. <laughs> then we just move then on. We just move on. <laughs> but it's, you know, I, I mean, I totally agree yeah. with you on this particular one. Um, when it's produced locally, mm. it gives some sort of confidence, confidence and yeah. sort of um, negates mm. the misconceptions and the stereotypes. I mean, Nana, COVID-19 negatively exposed the frailties yeah. we had in our, in our health, health sector and system, other yeah. um, industries. Agriculture was mm. badly affected. So many industries, mm. you get it. So it's a step in the right direction. It has never been about 
the lack of capacity. Mm. I mean, it's always been about the lack of political will well. and, of course, the funding gap. Yeah. Uh, that, of course, political will and government will mm. should be addressing issues with regards to funding. So it's never been about capacity. Mm. We have the researchers, we exactly. have the scientists, we have qualified people mm. in, in that area who, who should be leading the conversations in some of these things. And, mm. and for me particularly, I'm glad that they've stepped up, they've started a conversation, mm. and very soon we should be producing vaccines in Ghana, which, like you're saying, will go a long way to demystify some of the wrongly held conceptions and yeah. the stereotypes with regards to mm. people who are a little hesitant mm. in taking the vaccine. So it's, it's great news. I hope mm. they will not have challenges like we've seen in the past with regards to other initiatives. So mm. solid news. We hope it, it may, long may it continue. <laughs> long, long may it continue. All right, let's know what you think. The WhatsApp number is 055-058-5832. 055 But stay with us on CNR Extra. Ghana's inflation continues to soar, rising to 31.7% in July. I'll bring you the details shortly. Welcome back. This is CNR Extra here on City TV. Now, the Ghana Water Company is denying accusations that it has been overbilling its customers. Ghana Water Company Limited has refuted claims that it overbills its customers. It says it has on countless occasions gotten complaints from its customers that they are being overcharged. But the company articulates measures, including its electronic billing system, have been put in place to ensure customers do not encounter such errors. We have more in this report. The Ghana Water Company Limited has been undertaking exercises to clamp down on illegal connections for the past months. Already, it has disconnected over 20 illegally connected pipelines in the greater Accra region. Several warnings have been given to persons to desist from such acts. It says it incurs huge financial losses, thus affecting its operations. Commercial losses means illegal connection, people tampering with our meters. And that is where we want our customers to help us to check. It is important that communities take note of illegal connections. You have a fixed volume of water running from one point to the other within the community. And you have a number of people who are tapping on that line. What it means is that if you allow somebody to tap more than he should tap, he is using another customer's volume of water. And so it is not just Ghana Water Company that is losing, but the community members will be losing, especially those downstream. The Ghana Water Company Limited says the total water revenue for the year 2017 was 887 million Ghana cities and increased to 1.2 billion cities in 2021, representing a 36.3% rise. However, complaints of overcharging have also been a major problem on the side of customers. Reacting to that, during the launch of the operational guidance document on its water safety plans, the managing director of the Ghana Water Company Limited, engineer Dr. Clifford Brimer, revealed that measures including its electronic billing system have been put in place to ensure customers are not overbilled. The meters are up to date and are reading the numbers that they are churning out are not numbers that people sit and just cook by the numbers that the meters read. Sometimes people complain we have overbilling them. 
And GWCL, we say that it is our meter we know. Uh, your consumption, we are not there. And so we might not be able to argue with you. But if our meter says you consume 100 units, we'll bill you for the 100 units. Dr. Breimer also defended the reason for illegal water connections to be seen as a national security threat. The national security is coming in because if you cut a pipeline, whatever you introduce in the pipeline, nobody knows. And you have not been accredited. That means that you have the discipline and you have the training to connect and you go touch it. You can be a suspect. And so if national security makes it a security issue, people will stay away. When somebody, the adhesives we use to join the pipes, some are not human friendly. So what kind of adhesive will the illegal connection person have used? Nobody knows. And that is why it has to become a national security issue because we cannot compromise the quality of the water that we present. It looks like more of our agencies, our utility companies are being innovative. And it's exciting to hear. Mm -hmm. This morning I was reading somewhere that the company actually intends to introduce drones uh, to read <laughs> meters. I'm wondering how that uh, will work because, I mean, they have challenges with going into people's homes to read yeah, their meters. True. So they want to adopt uh, the use of drones to read meters. <laughs> Interesting, but yeah, of course, well, we're hopeful that this goes well yeah. and, of course, brings them the revenue that they need to continue the operations. I mean, no, no, nobody likes to overpay for anything clearly in any part of mm -hmm. the world. It's not even a Ghana thing. Yeah. So when concerns about overbailing camps, it's very important mm -hmm. that the regulator take it very serious. I mean, mm -hmm. if for nothing at all, we've seen a service unfold before our eyes, even as we are speaking yeah. in Krobo land, where people with say the they are being overbilled. I mean, aside mm -hmm. from those who say that they were promised after the dam was built mm -hmm. on their land. People yeah. are also saying they were overbuilt, hence their reluctance to pay these things. So it's very important that the Ghana Water Company Limited takes it up very seriously, mm -hmm. um, sought to explain to mm -hmm. the people what the issues are with, mm -hmm. with, with this, this particular, mm -hmm. and hopefully they can bring finality. What some people are looking for is just transparency, mm -hmm. and I'm sure they'll be willing to pay whatever they build. So uh, it's a step in the right mm -hmm. direction, and I hope they're able to sort out their differences. Right. Now, the government statistician has announced the inflation figures uh, for July uh, 2022. Take a look at this clip. Now, significant increases in prices of transport and food have pushed Ghana's inflation rate to hit over 31% in the month of July 2022. This was captured in the Consumer Price Index CPI data released by the Ghana Statistical Service on Wednesday, August 10, 2022. According to the data, food inflation rose again to record 32.3%, while non-food inflation was 31.3%. Here's a government statistician, Professor Samuel Inim, highlighting the impact of the key drivers on the increases in the overall inflation rate for July 2022. Fish and other seafood recorded the highest rate of inflation of 59.6% and again had the highest rate of 1.0%, which culminated in the overall regional average of 44.8%. July 2022 rate of inflation stood at 31.7%, indicating, indicating an increase from 29.8%, which was recorded for the month of May 20, for the month of June 2022. We decompose this from two perspectives: from a food and non-food inflation perspective, and from a domestic and imported inflation perspective. From a food and non-food perspective, we record food inflation 32.3% and 31.3% for non-food inflation. From a domestic and imported um, perspective, we record domestic inflation 29.2% and imported inflation 31.3%. From a regional perspective... This is the figure for July, 31.7. Mm. But the June figure broke a 20-year record. <laughs> yes, the last time inflation hit the 29s was yeah. in 2004. <laughs> it's, it's, it's <laughs> and it's been 20 years since, and today we are here recording 31.7. All this goes to impact the living conditions of the yeah, Kenyan. And, and for the one that broke that, the previous mm. month's one, the one that broke the 20 year record, like I've seen, if you look at the drivers of inflation in this country, some of the things I find in the list for me are, are really shocking. And, and, and it goes a long way to speak about how well we are tackling some of the, fin the financial mm. challenges we face in this country. But Nana, the downgrade further scores or underscores the fact that Ghana's public mm. finances is clearly not 
in its best shape at all. There's, there's a struggle, and for me, the most important thing is that the finance minister and, the, of course, the president admits it. So mm. that is a step in the right direction. Now, for me, what you expect to see or hear is what they are really doing to mitigate mm. the situation. I've heard a lot of economists call for an expedited um, um, approach with mm. regards to our IMF bailout. Exactly, yes, and, yeah. and for me, yeah. I feel it's very necessary that mm. we, we constitute mm. a team quite mm. different from the finance ministry and the, the old blocks mm. who are handling it right now. So there's some sort of agency attached to it. Because mm. if you look at the numbers, it doesn't, it doesn't put mm. uh, the country in a good space at all. Look at our debt figures, for mm -hmm. example. Our total yeah. debt stock is hovering around 393 yeah be a, a, a million Ghana city. So it's, 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 it's a serious mm. situation where we find ourselves. And mm. I expect that the finance ministry, government, put up a team mm. of, of, of experts, um, renowned economists, mm. not necessarily partisan people, who are able to work and make sure that an IMF package is agreed on so we don't become very an isolated important. case very, very like important. Sri Lanka and other Zimbabwe very, very and other countries where clearly, their package well, is We've delayed. lost credibility in the finance space and <laughs> it is important to have the IMF come in now to as a guarantor to, I mean, to salvage and of course give some confidence for investors to come in. Well, many thanks to you, Jude Mensah <laughs> Duncan. It's always great having you always on the show. Always a pleasure. Always a pleasure being on the of show. Of course, well. my name is Nana Tufuobwa and this has been our show for today. Many thanks to you for watching. We'll see you again.